as we continue our study of this little, though powerful book. We're going to be uh, in verse 13 of chapter 4 through 17 uh, this morning. Though this book uh, bears the title of Ruth, I think what we're seeing here, that, that Naomi has also been as much a focal point uh, as Ruth has. Uh, the, the narrative begins and it ends with Naomi. I mean, just consider this. It is Naomi who left the promised land with her husband Elimelech to seek security in Moab. It is Naomi who experienced the chastening hand of God, widowed there in Moab, also losing two sons, but she recognized that. It is Naomi who in repentance returned with Ruth to the land of promise. It is Naomi who directed uh, Ruth's path and again recognized God's providence in bringing Ruth to Boaz as a kinsman. It is Naomi who advised Ruth to pursue Boaz as a kinsman redeemer and a Leverite marriage uh, candidate. Now, it's back to Naomi in the closing portion of this little book. It's back to Naomi who has not been left without a redeemer. The question is, is when you look at this, who is the story about? Is it about Ruth? She plays a, a huge role. Is it about Naomi that I just spoke of and, and uh, caused you to consider these points? Or is it about Boaz, the kinsman redeemer? Well, I'm going to tell you it's about all three of them. But as we've said all the way along, the star of the book is the Lord. That is who this book is about. It's about our God. It's about Yahweh. That's what it's about. 85 verses, 22 references to the Lord in this little book. And here's the reason. Because the Lord is featured here as the one who is faithfully at work for His people, loving, caring for, and advancing His program no matter the time, no matter the, the atmosphere. And He calls upon His people in light of His working to live godly lives in, in kind, no matter how dark the climate may be. That's the theme. That's what we've been looking at entire, entire, in the entirety of the letter. What we learn from our text for this morning is this. Blessed is the Lord who has provided a Redeemer. We pick that up in verse 14. I want to read the text though. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And may His name become famous in Israel. May He also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of of David. The, th the, the, prop, or the proposition, the thrust of this text, blessed is the Lord who has provided a Redeemer. Now let's move through this narrative portion here, this last, really the last narrative portion before we get to the closing genealogy that's set forth there. And I want to move through here and notice several points that make that proposition clear when we look at these last verses, that it is about the Lord. Blessed is He 
who has provided a Redeemer. Point one, it is the Lord in this portion that opened Ruth's womb. Look at verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. It was the Lord who enabled Ruth to bear a child, to bear a son. Packed into this verse here, this verse 13, this is really a loaded verse because packed into this one verse is, is the summation of at least 10 months. At least 10 months. Really the immediate climax to God's plan and work for Naomi because we come back to her in the end of this letter. She becomes the focal point as to God's working. And that's why I even question whether this is really a story that focuses primarily on Ruth, though she's the one mentioned in the genealogy. It's Naomi who throughout the letter we've watched her walk and her feelings and her understanding of God come front and center throughout the letter. And now we're back to her. We're not told, when we look at this verse, we're not told about the wedding how that went, we weren't, we're not told what type of wedding they had, uh, where Boaz took Ruth on her honeymoon. We're not told any of the details at all. We're just told he took her as his wife. We're not told how much time elapsed between the marriage and the birth of their firstborn son. We're not told any of that. We don't know. But what we are told is very significant. And what we're told is, is the Lord enabled her to conceive. Now I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. Because here's the issue. After 10 years, Naomi was in, in, in Moab for 10 years. Her sons married Moabite women. Ruth being one. And Orpah being the other. 10 years in Moab, Ruth was barren. While she was there. She was not able to have a child for 10 years in Moab. She too is widowed there. And she has built such a relationship with her mother-in-law. That she has a fierce loyalty for her and love for her mother. Naomi. And she goes back. Now she's redeemed. She has entered into a Leverite marriage with a kinsman of Naomi and her womb is opened and she gives birth to a son. Now how is that possible? It's the Lord. It's the Lord. This verse, when I read this verse, I thought of the A-team. I said the A-team? <laughs> the A-team? How do you go to the A-team? Uh, those of you who remember the show, the A-team, popular series back in the the, the 80s, and uh, comical to watch a group of mercenary type soldiers uh, going out and kind of fixing the ills of, uh, or the injustices in people's lives and, and just kind of hiring out to these folks. And there's a couple guys that you might remember uh, in, the, in their roles. George Papard played in it and also Mr. T uh, played in it, was famous for his mohawk and his gold jewelry. Uh, but, but George Papard's character was Hannibal. That was his name. He was called Hannibal. And, and on, in every episode, every episode, he would say at the end, or, or as it was all climaxing, coming together, he would say, I love it when a plan comes together. I love it when a plan comes together. This, folks, in this verse, is exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing the plan come together. We're seeing the plan working out as God had intended. And it's all by the Lord's design. That's what we're seeing here. This is God who stars here. That's why we come back to Naomi, but we come back to the Lord because He's the one who's made it happen. And we'll see that unfold even more as we look at the second point. The second point that establishes that, that, that proposition. Second point is this. It was the Lord who provided for 
Naomi. Look at 14 through 15. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And may His name become famous in Israel. May He also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. So point two, what we see here is, is it was the Lord who provided for Naomi. It was first the Lord who caused Ruth to conceive. Now it's the Lord we find who is responsible for the provision here in her life, Naomi's life. Because when she came back, how did she come back? She came back, it said empty, disillusioned, understanding that God's hand was upon her, that He was not pleased. She looked at it as a chastening. I don't think she was a mess. Most people say that, oh, she was just bitter or angry. I think she was discerning. She understood God's providence, His sovereignty, and how He works and moves, and how he, he chastens those whom He loves, and He causes them to come back and do the right things. He had a greater plan here. And we learn here, it was the Lord who was providing for her. Now you might say, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I thought it was Ruth through a marriage to Boaz, who was a kinsman redeemer, who exercised the Leverite marriage uh, provision, and honored the loyalty of Ruth to her mother-in-law that in reality provided for Naomi. Now that's a mouthful. Right? I got it out. Here's the thing. I have to say to that, really? Is that what we see stringing along throughout this letter? A bunch of connected circumstances? Incidents that seemingly wondrously connected, but they're fatalistic little chance happenings? No. What you're seeing is God was providing, moving, working, caring for, loving, and, and providing for Naomi. He was taking care of her. She was responding to her, her, the hand of discipline. She had repented. She had come back. And it was God who did all that. All of that happened not by, oh, that's just what happened. She came back and there's a kinsman and this kinsman's going to... No, we even found out that there was one closer. Remember last time? There was one closer than Boaz. But whose pick was, was, was God's? Boaz. So what happened? This guy was financially not in a position to be able to handle the obligation of a Ruth. And what came with that? And he bows out and hands it over to Boaz which we already knew that was God's intention all along. So this is God. And the women of Bethlehem, they saw it plain. I love it. Here's the interesting thing. When God's working in people's lives, don't think that people aren't noticing. They spot this. They saw how she came back because it wasn't it them who said, who is that? Is that Naomi? Is that Naomi? Because she looked downtrodden. She looked like she was under the thumb of God. Or had been. She came back empty. And now things are happening. And what do the people of Bethlehem say? Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. Today. See, it's not Boaz who's provided for her. Who's doing it? It's the Lord. It's God. We need to learn that lesson too. We need to learn to look past the immediate incident. And I'm not saying don't be thankful for the people who bless your life, but understand God uses people to bless your life. So when you bow at night, you thank that person in person for blessing your life, but when you bow at night, you thank God for blessing you with that person who ministered to your life. Because it's really God. And in this book, it becomes very clear that it's God who's loving and caring for and advancing His program for His people. 
And his expectation is that they live responsibly. They live godly in whatever climate they find themselves in, no matter how dark the period of the judges, where everybody was doing that which was right in their own eyes. And you have these wonderful people. I'm telling you, we've watched wonderful people here living in terrible times and shining for the Lord. They don't bypass His law. They embrace the provisions. They do what God expects. They move with God's hand and God's able to work and bless them and use them. And what we find is it all comes back around here at the end of the letter to the praise of who? The Lord. And that's where it belongs because He is the star here. So when we look at here, uh, I, I said this last time, and, and I want to make this point. You know, some, those who would say, well, yeah, he did this and this. Listen, we talked about it last week. Even the kinsman redeemer provision and the Leverite marriage provision, that's in where? God's law. And I, I told you last time, they were put in there, and I could say this, not solely for this point in time, but for this point in time as well, as any other time it was used for Israel. And so that's what we have here. Note the women of Bethlehem, they recognize God's hand. Also notice the Redeemer. It says the Goel, the Goel, the Redeemer. You have a Redeemer. has not left you without a Redeemer today. Here's the question on this. There's a question on this. I find it interesting. Is the Redeemer that she's not been left with Boaz or is it the son? The baby. Well, you know what the answer is? Some people say that it's Boaz, but what's here is it's that son. It's the baby. Because we're, we're told that, that he's born to you th today. That, that, that she's given birth to him. Who? The Redeemer. Now, wait a minute. Whoa, Boaz. Boaz is the kinsman Redeemer. He is. But the son is what's mentioned here as the redeemer as it relates to Naomi. Also, this blessing is pronounced. I'll add some more to that in just a moment. The blessing is pronounced here. May his name become famous in Israel. Much the same as that blessing or that, that blessing or prayer was uttered in regard to Boaz. This is said of the baby. May he, now listen to this, I love this. This grandbaby, this son... May he be a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. Grandbabies. <laughs> They're restorers of life in a very real way. If you're a grandparent, you know that it's true. It, it, they spark vitality in you. They bring joy that may have, been, have kind of waxed cold. Where, where you're, 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 there's something happens again. You just like you're seeing their life, and you're connected there in this relationship with them, and it, and it brings vitality. But even more so for Naomi. For Naomi, why? She's been widowed. Elimelech is gone. Malon is gone. Kil Kilion is gone. But she has a daughter-in-law who loves her, is loyal to her. And she enters into a kinsman-redeemer relationship with Boaz who fulfills the Leverite marriage. And there's a son raised up to who? Not Boaz. That was the beauty of what we looked at last time. He was raised up to whose lineage and heritage? Malon's, Elimelech's. This was Malon's son legally. So for Ruth, I mean for Naomi, this son is a redeemer of life for her. He brings joy. He's going to be the sustainer of her future. Her whole estate, her whole life is going to be tied to this son. The son of Malon. Due to the Leverite marriage. The women, they point out Ruth's role and her value. And it's very powerful because you've got to think about it. What was she telling her on the way back? You, you need to stay in Moab. 
You need to stay in Moab. Your, your, your prospects are better if you stay in Moab. The, the potential for you to get remarried and have a life is better here. I'm not going to do it. What am I going to do? Your people are going to become my people. And your God is going to become my God. And I'm never going to leave you, lest it be by death. That was her vow before the Lord. And these women, guess what they say to her? Seven is significant because seven in Scripture is is perfection or completeness. And so what they're saying about Ruth, she's better to you than what seven sons could have ever been to you. That's high praise. That's high praise. Because she, she redeemed her life. She's restored her life, or her hope, her future. It's bright. It springs eternal in a very real way because it is eternal. It's in the Lord. It's with God and the blessing of this, this child. It's by God's hand. He had provided for her. And Ruth was better than seven sons, the women said, because she had given birth to him, that son. Now, as back, back just briefly to the debate regarding whether this, this Redeemer is Boaz that's in view, and I'll read the, the verse again so you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, verse 14, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. Today. And may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to what? Him. Who? The Redeemer. The Redeemer. So to deal with the language, your, your best track is it is the baby. For the reasons I stated. But I believe they're intertwined because obviously they have to be. Because this baby, the son, cannot be the kinsman redeemer. Boaz had to be the kinsman redeemer. So you can't factor Boaz out. But because of the Leverite marriage provision, this child is in a place where this is the son legally of Malon. And he is a redeemer in all the sense of the word as it relates to redeeming her life from that of of a place of despair. Because now she has a son. A son. And we're going to find that they even identify the child as the son of who? Not Ruth, but Naomi. Naomi's son. So I believe they're intertwined here. The idea, but the, 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 the... the specific antecedent there to him is the, the, the Redeemer, which would make him the Son. Point three, though, that establishes this truth we're looking at uh, regarding uh, blessed be the Lord who has provided a Redeemer, and it is this. This was the Lord moving his program forward. And this becomes very significant for next, next week. Okay, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to just throw it all out here in just a couple statements because I want you to really get a sense for what we're, we'll look at next time, and I don't want to give it all up. So anyway, the, the, the Lord was moving his program forward. Look at 16 and 17. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. And there it is. I thought he was born to Ruth. He was born to Ruth physically, but he's the legal son of Malon, who is the son of Naomi, who was the husband of Ruth, who is widowed and is now married to Boaz. Telling you, that's God. You get all confused and all you got to say is, God, (laughs) God, he works this way. We shouldn't be blown away when you see this thing, these kind of things happening with God's people. Where God does things in a way that he, it, it seems like there's no possible way any good comes out of it. And all of a sudden God is glorified. He can, he can turn the circumstances and bring glory to his name. And that's what we see here. But it was the Lord moving his program forward here. 
Because it says, so they named him Obed, and then it says this, this sentence, he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Of David. So what do we have here? Well, I just want to mention in context here, this whole verse here, and if you've got a study Bible, some of your study Bibles may pick up on this, I'm not sure. But uh, it says, Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. Uh, some take this as a formal adoption, uh, like a symbolic of a formal adoption where he becomes her son. I don't necessarily, I'm not saying that that's not here. I don't necessarily see that as a necessity uh, in, in, in this regard. It is her son, uh, Boaz, uh, entered into that Leverite understanding uh, in, in that provision, uh, and he understood that. We talked about it last time. He understood that that's what was taking place because he said that if you take, you're the nearer kinsman. If you do this, you have you have to marry Ruth, and you assume her uh, the responsibilities uh, uh, that that come with that. And so uh, we 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 know that that that's the case. I I don't really necessarily see it here. I just see it as a grandma becoming a care caregiver to her grandson, but uh, in a mother sense because of the law. But uh, I don't know that there was a formal act here, and nor, nor did the commentators, by the way. It's mostly conjecture. They have no real, you know what I mean? This is exactly what happened. It's just more guys batting around the culture of the day. But then in verse 17, a son has been born to Naomi, and like I said, that, that goes back to the Leverite deal. But then in 17b, we get the gist of this in this regard, and this is where we wrap up uh, as of today. And that is this, God's program is going forward. And if you remember the theme, what was the theme again? When we look at this, it, it was, the Lord is faithfully at work, no matter the time, loving, caring for, and advancing His program for His people who are to live godly lives. But what's He doing? He's advancing his program. And, I want, and this, this hit me. For his people. I didn't know when I, when I came up with that statement. But that's dead on right. Because God's program moves forward. For his glory. But always for his people. Because God is always for his people. We're there. We're part of that. And Israel was too. And so was Naomi. So was Ruth. So was Boaz. And immediately, in the immediate context, he blessed them. And we could say in verse 14, you can reach that conclusion, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer. Who? Naomi. Hadn't left her without a Redeemer when? Today. In the immediate context of history, God provided for Naomi. And he was blessed. He was recognized as the instrument through which it occurred. He's the one who caused it to happen. These are awesome, awesome words that are extended in regard to Naomi's situation. They were realized in her immediate context of her life. But note that the text ends looking forward. It's looking forward. How's it looking forward? In that last sentence... So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. By the way, Obed is servant or worshiper. That's what's meant by that. And this Obed would be the father of Jesse and the father of David. What are we doing? We're looking ahead. We're looking ahead. And we're looking ahead specifically at one person. Yes, Jesse's mentioned, but only as the father of the one they end the genealogy with, and that's David. And we'll get that significance uh, more so next time. So what we have is, is this. I'll leave you with the theme one more time. God is faithfully at work. He is the star in this record. He's working. He is demonstrated in, in this historical story that he loves, he cares for, and he advances his program for his people. And his expectation upon them, uh, of which uh, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz rose to the occasion, they lived godly, responsible lives in a very dark climate. And that's his expectation upon us. And here's the power of this letter. 
If you believe in the God that's been demonstrated in this book, it's not all that hard to live for Him in dark times. It's when you can't place Him in your circumstances and you can't discern His hand moving that you're in some deep water. But when you can see God in the events of life, it's easy to live for Him no matter how dark it gets. It gets a lot easier because He's in control. He's in control. And we see it here. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love You and we thank You for Your Word again this day. And we look forward to next week, Lord, where we wrap up this little but powerful book. And Lord, we are reminded this day that You are the star, that this is a story about You. It contains people specifically, but the greater truth is about you and how you're able to work and how that allows us to live lives that count no matter how bleak our times can get. Help us to grasp that truth and live in light of it, Lord, each one of us. I ask your blessing now upon each one who's come out, Lord, uh, for being under your truth this day. Encourage them, go forward into the week with them and help us count for you. And again, we ask your blessing upon the club ministries uh, tonight as well. May you impact young lives for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.